This is an example of taking audio and graphics and, and in some sense bridging the divide between them. And this is a very good patch for you to load on your laptops while your professor drones away. Um, <laughs> basically, the, well, you can tell exactly what's happening. Um, <coughs> so as I, as I was saying, Jim is all about polynomials, or sorry, poly polygons. And what you see here is a bunch of polygons, but so far I've shown you two rectangles, so this is a whole thing with, uh, with the whole mess. So what I want to do is just sort of show you how you would put together something very simple like this. And I, I got to say, this is not going to win you any prizes being able to do this kind of thing, but um, the, interesting, the interesting stuff that I think that you can do with Jim with with geometric kind of modeling like this is things where you algorithmically generate hundreds or thousands or millions of polygons to make um, shapes or, or other kinds of collections of stuff in space. Um, and I don't have any good examples of that sitting here right now, so I'm not going to try to develop one. I'm instead just going to show you this kind of very simple gener you know, sort of generating example of, okay, here's how you would use audio analysis to drive a picture. And then we'll just sort of leave Jim for, for future years. And uh, then I have five other topics um, in PD that I'm not going to have time to do properly, so I want to mention that they exist and um, give each one of them maybe 10-ish minutes each. And that will be plenty for today. And then we're going to be done for the quarter, except, of course, for final projects. Um, so the plan for today. Um, it's not just one thing, it's a bunch of things, but each of them is only just kind of on the surface. One is I'm going to just sort of finish up with Jim with this example. And then um, the example actually you, has, has an example or is an example of using audio analysis. And there are lots and lots of things that you can do with analyzing sounds. And so I want to show you the basic tools that PD has available for doing audio analysis and some of the things that you can do with that. Um, and then there are other things that you might want to know about, which I will tell you about as I get to them, but basically four other classes of things. Um, each of, well, I should say these are just sort of quick topics. Net receive and net send is making network connections between computers. Uh, read SF, write SF is spooling audio to and from disk so that you can do things like make sound with PD and have a sound file afterward. And PD tilde is a trick for doing PD with multiprocessing. It's a way of, of having PD sprout child PDs that can run on other processors. So each of those things takes a few minutes to describe, and then they're done. Fourier, uh, the Fourier analysis and resynthesis, uh, I'm going to just show you one very simple example of this. But this is a thing which you could easily study for uh, months or years. Um, in fact, it's, it's true that um, uh, it's true that most people have to study this and think they learn it and then come back a year later and realize that there's actually another point of view on it that you wanted to know it from and so on for three or four iterations before you really have enough points of view down that you really believe that you know Fourier analysis and synthesis uh, uh, fluently. So this is a thing that which I want to tell you the existence of it will not start actually going on because it's just a big thing. Okay. Um, but anyway, back to the gym example. Um, this is, all right, so what's happening? Every time I talk, sound is going to the microphone. So we're having to do two things, really. We're, we're measuring the loudness of a sound. That's a technique which is old. It, it dates back to the, at least to the analog synthesizer days. And it's called envelope following. And it's one of the three kinds of analysis that I'm going to be showing you in some more detail next time. But at least now, what I'll do is show you how it works into this example. OK, so envelope following. Uh, let's, OK, yeah, this is kind of a mess. I like actually running sound files to this. If you, have your, um, if you have a recording of your favorite politician giving a speech, this is a great way to listen to that. Um, so what I'm going to do is try to figure out where all the stuff is. Not there. All right, come on. What am I doing wrong? Got that, got that. And audio in. So, oh, PD works. Here we are. <laughs> this is the real thing. All right. So, what does a bird consist of? Um, okay. So, 
last but not least is going to be PD sound, where we're actually getting the uh, loudness of the sound coming to the microphone. So I'm going to save that because, for continuity's sake, I'll talk about the graphics first. Even though the logic, the flow of information is from sound to graphics, so I'm going to be doing going upstream in, in information flow here for a few minutes. Okay. So what would you do? Well, these things are all. Um, well, these. I'll, I'll do this in some detail. This, these 100 rectangles uh, are going to be the bird's body. So part of the trick to drawing the bird is making the, this shape, which is a very irregular shape, which you can't make very simply out of, um, out of polygons. So there's a, there's a thing for making 100 polygons that makes that shape that I'll show you. Okay. Then there are isolated things, which are, um, uh, let's see, this thing is a rectangle this twig that it's sitting on. The, the legs are, I believe, trapezoids, although I have to go check. Um, and these, are, these eyes are actually hexagons. That's cheesy, but that's what I did. And this beak is three triangles. There are two triangles for the top part of it and just one triangle for the bottom. Right? And those triangles are the only thing in the whole thing that's moving. And in fact, the only, the only thing that's moving in this are four points in space, which are, first off, the two sides of the beak, which are chosen at random whenever it finds a new attack, so that basically the width of the beak is sort of changing word by word, except it's not working too great right now. And then the, you can tell the, the bottom and the top of the beak, sorry, the, the two points in front of the beak, which if there's no sound going in at all, are one point there, so there are two points which are um, which lie on a vertical segment, and they're and they're some fixed point plus and minus the envelope value that is coming in from the incoming sound. Right. So these two are, are random, but but are set off by attacks and sound, and these two are the continuously changing envelope. <coughs> That's the whole deal. Right. Okay. So how do you do it? Uh, what I want to do is find some simple stuff first, and then and then show you the, the complicated stuff. So here is simple stuff. This is um, so I told you that everything I told you that everything is triangles, and then um, of course here I'm making a four four vertex polygon, which is a quadrilateral. Um, if you make quadrilaterals in OpenGL or GIM, uh, make sure that the four points are coplanar because it will do the wrong thing if you give it a skew quadrilateral, a quadrilateral whose, whose, whose vertices are not planar. In this case, most, almost everywhere, the uh, Z value... Yeah, so you can all just look at my screen. <laughs> I don't know how this is going to work. We'll see. Um, so, all right, so, so the basic yoga of Jen is you're going to make things that have um, planar polygons. The easiest way to make a planar polygon is to make a triangle because there's no way you will ever find to make a triangle not be planar. Right? Uh, if you make something with four or six points, then it's more work. But the easy way then to make a polygon be planar is if you just set all the z coefficients to the same value, then you know it's on a plane, which is z equals constant. Otherwise, you might have to work harder. Okay. Now I'm just going to sort of talk into the air to tell you how the um, the, the hard part, which is getting actually is getting the body of the bird, not the not the beak. The hard part is is this. I went in and <coughs> made a table, which has two. Actually, I made a. Let's see. So you've made a, you've made arrays before. Uh, I might have shown you on one I in event or at one moment um, a graph that had two different arrays in it. Um, so I made a graph with two different arrays in it, and I drew the arrays to make the outline of the bird's body. So. It's not, it's, um, let's see, what's the right word? It's not, it, this wouldn't be true of any possible shape, but the bird's body is actually designed in such a way that um, the, every cross section of it, every, um, yeah, every, every, anytime you intersect a vertical line with it, you just get a segment. You never get two different segments. In other words, the shape never does this. Um, the shape is always just from one point to another vertically. And so you can describe that fully by just making two functions, which is to say well, the contour of the top of the bird and the contour of the bottom of the bird. Right? And that was the only reason that I had the patience to stand and do this, because I was able to think of a shape that that, that was true of. Right? 
Okay, so then um, what do you do? Well, you make a whole bunch of rectangles. So you, you saw, although I didn't go into it, an abstraction that was called uh, Rect 10. There were 10 of them uh, at the left side of the screen. Each one of those things is making 10 rectangles. Cool, thank you. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Brady Baker. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So where were we? Oh yeah. So I was telling I was telling you by waving my hands in the air. Um, okay. The body of the bird goes from here to here, and here it is. It is PD tables, and this is my own artistry. So I went and drew these two lines, and then how do you get those out? Well, you, you probably know, but um, okay. So. This is stupid. How do you make a hundred things in PD if you don't want to draw? If you don't want to make a hundred boxes, you make ten copies of an abstraction, each of which has ten of the things. <laughs> and if you want a thousand of them, you know where to go. <laughs> you know how to do that too now. Okay. Um, so the rec. So the basic deal here is we're going to tell this rectangle. Oh, dollar one, dollar two, dollar three. That means array one, array two, and ten, twenty, thirty, forty, blah blah. Okay. So what ha is happening here is this is going to be rect array 1, array 2, 10, 0. And this will be the same thing except 20, 0, and so on like that. So we go in here. So now $3 is tens and $4 is units, and you're going to add the two of them to get a number which will range from 10 to 99 or something like that. I'm not sure how it works. And what are we going to do? Well, we're going to go reading four points out of the table, which are, uh, sorry, let's get back and get the table. So for each, so there, uh, let's see, I said rectangles, but really the, um, really the strips that we're drawing is trapezoids, because the bird's top and bottom are not necessarily parallel, right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to draw, draw four points, a planar polygon having four points in it. And the four points are going to be picked off by looking at two adjacent points up here and two adjacent points down there. All right. So then how do we do that? Uh, first off, we get the data that we need, which is tab reading, um, what's the right word? Tab reading the f array one and array two. Oh, uh, yeah. So here, here's dollar one is array one, dollar two is array two, dollar uh, three is ten, dollar four is zero, right? So here's tab read array one and tab read array two. And here is tab read array 1 and array 2, but there the coefficients, or sorry, the locations that we're looking at is one point further. One point further than what? Okay, so we are going to receive from somewhere upstairs a message which is just a sequence of bangs in time called do it. Actually, every single time do it gets banged, the same thing comes out because nothing's changing here, but maybe something will be changing later. We want to make the bird do something funny. Right, so, so this is a good way to just sort of compute a shape in such a way that if if, for instance, for every single frame of, uh, that we want to draw in, in gem, we might want to recompute the shape. Uh, okay, so this is so bangs come in, and now we compute what number we are, and we do that by adding dollar three and dollar four. <laughs> Trigger bang bang, get out dollar four, get out dollar three, and add them. And then we take that number and throw it in five different places. Why do we need? Well, six different places if you count this. Okay, so we need to do six things. We look up four points out of the tables. And we need to figure out the, so that, that's four y coordinates, and then we need x coordinates. <coughs> and there will be two different separate x coordinates, which are the x location of the left hand side of the trapezoid <coughs> and the x location of the right. So it's x1, x2, and then y1, y2, y3, y4, right? So I told you about getting the y values out of the table. The x's are just take the x value, whatever it is, and fudge. So, in general, when you want to change something's range, you multiply by something and or add something. Uh, in this case, I subtracted 50 so that it goes from minus 40 up to 50, I believe. I'm not sure about that. Up to 49. And then multiply it by something which is, well, divide by 20, which is to say get it into gym units, which are from minus 3 to plus 3 if you're on the z equals 0 plane. And that's just sort of knowledge that I have, that you have to go from minus 3 to plus 3. That's the size of things in gym, unless you change it. Okay, so, so here, this thing is, has a range of about 100, so when we divide by 20, it has a range of about 5, which is to say most of the way across the screen. 
which is what you see in the bird. Okay, and so we just take the number and then we take it plus two, plus two, yeah, all right, why not, whatever. And uh, that's strange. Why wouldn't that be plus one? So, so the numbers that come, so the numbers that come in here are, are all the numbers from 10 to 90 to 109, I think, actually, uh, in, in increments of 1. And what this is saying is that the rectangles are actually overlapping slightly because it's going from 10 to 12 and then from 11 to 13 and so on like that. Go figure. That's what I had to do to make it work right. Open GL. All right. Okay. Uh, and then here are points. Points are three coordinates apiece. And jolly us, the z coordinate is always zero because we're flat on the z equals zero plane. And x and y are just being computed. Well, the y values are coming out of the tables, one, two, three, four, and the x values are coming out of these computations. And that's those are the vertices of this trapezoid, which is going to be a polygon with four points. And the four points are specified using triples, packed triples each. And so here's point one, two, three, and four. You can make a polygon with as many points as you want, but, um, but do make it planar. Uh, in fact, make it convex. Why? It says in the OpenGL you can only make convex polygons. <laughs> okay, and then meanwhile, now what you saw last time was simple gem examples where uh, there was basically a gem head object, blah, 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 until finally you get down to a thing which you have to draw, which is a polygon of some kind. And here, Jim head set the color to black, which is that, and then draw a polygon. So the Jim chain, if you like, that's to say the, the sequence of events which happens in this window every time it renders a frame, is head, set color, draw a polygon. And there are a hundred of these. So that is that is this body. And now I'm just going to go fishing around and find the beak. I believe this is the beak down here. And yeah, let's see. Can I scroll in such a way as to make it easier to see this? Oh, dig. Okay. Uh, these are the eyes. <laughs> I told you they were hexagons. Um, I just did this in my head and figured out the points of a regular, uh, the coordinates of a regular hexagon. If you if you studied trig in high school and if you haven't forgotten it, you can do that. All right. Uh, so these are two hexagons with um, centers. They should be getting added, but they're not. Oh, I see. I'm using translate to move the eyes over to where you want them. And, in fact, just for testing sake, and this is, by the way, how, you, how I actually designed this, I fixed it so that um, the translate actually had a nice <laughs> message box on it so I could figure out where I wanted the eyes to be. And then when I got the eyes where I wanted them to be, I copied the, the numbers into here. All right. C to the pants. <laughs> okay. Um, now, the beak. That's the only part that's actually doing anything animated, right? And I've lost the beak. These are the two legs. Um, where's the beak? The beak is probably going to have to be in that sound. All right, come here, scroll. Oh, beak, duh. Beak, here's a beak. <laughs> All right, this is, um, this is where you start to realize that PD makes a lousy programming. In, uh, language, right? This, if you were a programmer, would be two lines of code. But it, since we're in PD land, uh, it's not two lines of code, it's a whole messy page of, of stream of consciousness, right? The, the good thing is you can actually program PD by stream of consciousness, which you can't really do in C. The bad thing is, of course, that then you have to explain it. <laughs> it looks like stream, stream of consciousness, right? which is what it is. Okay, so, uh, so here's the deal. Um, beaks consist of three polygons. Uh, and there should be a pair of two of them that are uh, that share vertices. Where are they? Drat! And I got to make this smaller so I can start scrolling. There, good enough. Okay, there are the three polygons. Now, 
Um, what you don't see is this number here is coming in from here, and this is the this is a number that goes up when you make noise with the mic and goes down when you don't. All right. So that we're going to look at later. That's the envelope follower. Right. And notice again, I've I've messed around to try to get this thing to have some reasonable what's the right word? Some reasonable um, range of values. All right. So now. Here what we have is, let's see, this is going to be the bottom triangle of the beak. I can tell because it's, um, because the, this, this number is going to, be get, going to be used in two different ways depending on um, where we're at. Okay, so what, what's happening here is there's a floating point number which is going into, this, into the second, which is the y coordinate of this polygon. The x coordinate, that's to say the First value is zero, which means the beak is right in the middle of the window. Is that true? It's not true. Oh, there's a, probably a translate object. Oh, yeah, right. Here we go. Here's translation again. This is me figuring out where to put the beak. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> okay, let's put it back. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> okay. So we're translated. So, uh, so since we're using the translation, we can think of everything as being centered around zero, which is what's happening down here. So all we're doing is we're packing something that has a y value, which is oh, which is the envelope value times minus one. But what's happening here? Oh, I'm sorry. This is the other thing. This is the width of the beak, which is this number, all right? So that is getting randomized every time there's an attack, which I'll show you later. So that's, a, that's something called W for width, and then the other thing is H for height, and that's getting computed elsewhere. So the height is the, okay, so there are three polygons, sorry, there are three points of the polygon, which are the left corner, the right corner, and the bottom point of the beak. So here's the left corner, which is at zero, here's the right corner, oh, sorry, that's the right corner at zero, here's the left corner at zero minus one, so there's point one. Ah, oh, weird. Okay. And then that number is changing when this changes. Whoa. Interesting. All right. Now. Why can't I get a good number there? Huh. There. All right. Got the beak back. All right. Okay, so I'm going to stop improvising now and just tell you that a after a while you'll make all sorts of mistakes and then at some point you'll get all those points right and then you'll have a nice moving beak. Okay, now what I do want to do is go back and show you where these numbers come from because that's the, that's the connection with the audio. And so those are numbers which are H, this is receive height and receive width, and those numbers are being computed as a function of the sound. So, cool object. The envelope follower, this is a thing, um, <coughs> I can sort of tell you what it does. It's, it's, a, it's taking the signal and squaring it and then putting it through a low-pass filter. Yeah. Are you coming in from the mic? Yeah. Yeah, this is the mic. So, if I turn it off, now, you have, now you're seeing the noise floor of my audio system. And now you're seeing the noise floor of the room. And now you're seeing the noise of me talking, which is a little bit louder than that. All right. Okay. This is in uh, this is in decibels, and reasonable dynamic range of something that's happening, depending on what it is, could be 30 to 60 decibels. So when you're just sort of talking, uh, it's you know it's it's varying like 20 or 30 decibels. If uh, if if you have a trained singer singing something, it's going to be more like 60 dB or 60 decibels because they use dynamics a lot harder than regular people talking do. Um, okay, so what we're going to, going to do is take that and figure out a good way to change its units into something useful. Useful units are things that range maybe from 0 to 1-ish, which is what's going on here. How do you get it to range from 0 to 1? Well. You just basically fudge until something good happens. And in this case, what the, the fudge consisted of, let's assume that the noise floor is going to be 30 dB. Why? Because 
It turns out that a wide variety of rooms, the noise floor is somewhere in the 20s of dBs when you, when you set a reasonable volume level. It's just a good number. Okay, and so what you do is you take this and subtract out what you think the noise floor is so that you'll get a number that is, that is positive when something is happening above the noise floor and, and negative when it's just noise. And then you, you use this wonderful binary operation max, which is maximum. So if you ask for the maximum of zero in something, then when it's positive, the maximum is the number, and when it's negative, the maximum is zero. So this is a way of clipping the thing below by zero. Right. And then, this is where your hand really starts seriously to wave. What should be the transfer function by which the amount of decibels in, in excess of 30 uh, turns into the height of the beak? The answer might not be just plug the number of decibels straight into the height. Um, I discovered that it's better to have loud noises have a, um, have a proportionally larger effect than quiet ones. So I ended up deciding that the right thing to do is to square the number so that, for instance, 10 dB turns into 100, but, uh, but 20 dB turns into 400, right? And it should th therefore be true that as I get louder, the change in the beat gets more pronounced. <laughs> it's not really true, though. Anyway, if, um, if you don't square it, then you get that the mouth is just sort of always sitting kind of open and doing a little bit of this stuff. And you really want it to sh open and shut, and it turns out that the way to do that is to square the, the envelope. Square the, the number in dB. Go figure. In fact, I'll show you how it can be lame. I'll, I'll just not square it. And then, of course, I'll have to multiply it by something different. Let's, let's actually get a new one. OK, so we'll just say $F1 times something small. So five ten thousandths, let's try this number. There we are. That's kind of lame, right? And so if you don't square the envelope, you either have that kind of lameness or else you have the beak always shut kind of lameness, but you don't get a decent range of openness and shutness. And I don't know how to explain it any better than that. And furthermore, I don't believe I even explained the X per object, did I? This is your object for making C-like mathematical expressions, where $F1 means the floating point number coming in inlet 1, and $F2 is the floating point number com coming in inlet 2, and so on. So if you wanted to do this with just regular objects, you'd have to do a trigger float float, so you could multiply the thing by itself, and then you'd have a separate object to multiply it by. So this is replacing three objects with one expert. Expert was written by Sharot Yadagari, who teaches in the theater department here. Yeah? Um, what's that number of Oh, yeah, thank you. Okay, so I, uh, I pulled it, uh, I, I ran roughshod over one important detail. So, envelope followers are, classically anyway, an envelope follower is take the signal, rectify it somehow, such as, for instance, square it and then run it through a low pass filter. Uh, this particular envelope follower is better than that. What it does is it looks at a certain window of the signal and multiplies it by a smoothing function and then measures the total power within that window. This number that you give it is a power of 2, which is the size of the window that it analyzes. So here, I decided that I wanted, um, I decided that I wanted it to analyze a tenth of a second at once basically because a tenth of a second is large enough to hold a syllable or to, or to hold a sort of an utterance of some sort. Um, why is this a tenth of a second? It's in, it's in samples, and we're at 44K1 sample rates, so 4,096 is about a tenth of a second. Uh, if you make this smaller, which you can, like let's make it 256, then it starts moving, it starts outputting stuff real fast, and then, hello, hello, that's still working just fine. Never mind that. I was expecting you to, like, for instance, if I make a steady sound with a low pitch, it might get to the point that sometimes the envelope falls between peaks of the, of the thing and gives you a smaller number, and sometimes it falls on a peak and gives you a bigger number. And so if I give it 100 hertz or so, oh, it's not very steady, right? Oh, like that. So now if you tell the envelope 
to look at more samples at once, you do the same thing and it gives you a much stabler looking result. Oh, uh, I think. Oh, uh, yeah. It's better. So, in general, I mean, this is this is actually easy to understand with envelope following, but it's in general kind of a truth of audio analysis that the larger a window of, of data you look at, the stabler, the less um, the less ragged the, the output is going to be, or the less quickly changing the output is going to be. All right. So that, so I just threw it a, a large number for that reason. And yes, ENV tilde for technical reasons only likes powers of two. It's ugly. It will, if you give it some other value, it'll just change it to a power of two for you. But of course, if you just give it the power of two, then it does exactly what you said, and you can see what it's doing, which is better. All right. So, uh, so I haven't told you a whole lot about ENV tilde. I've just sort of, I'm just sort of letting you enjoy what it does. And so now, what I'm going to do, actually, ENV tilde, I've told you just about everything that you need to know about it. Um, although I will just pull it out in its own right. Actually. Everyone's tired of the bird now, right? Can I get rid of the bird? <laughs> you want the bird? <laughs> what would its name be? <laughs> okay, well, you know, we can keep the bird around. I don't think it'll hurt us to have the bird out. The only thing is I, um, I should try to miniaturize this window. Do what? Yeah, this is, you know, I made this some years ago, so um, so this is probably flying around the net already, but I'll stick it up on my site too. This is a very useful tool. <laughs> you might not believe it now, <laughs> but when you grow up, you'll realize that you need things like this. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay, envelope following. So, uh, it's the usual thing that you can imagine. Take, um, take the, uh, oh, actually, let's not, let's not do the, oh, let's not look at that. Let's look at a nice oscillator. So we'll take an oscillator, and I'm going to have a number box to say what it is. Oops, no, wait, what am I doing? So now we'll have an oscillator with a controllable frequency, and then we're going to say envelope. Oops, gosh, I'm not using the right key accelerators today. And I'll, you know, just, just for consistency's sake, let's say 4,096 now. And then we'll look at the result. Oh, we could look at the result using one of these. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure this is actually better pedagogy or not. This is a slider. This is a thing which... Um, it's a nice graphical control that lets you do this kind of stuff, right? You've all probably found it already. Okay, so, gee, what's happening? Uh, in is going this oscillator. It has a frequency of zero, and out is coming a value which I believe is going to be 100. Actually, we should look at it, too. Ta-da. All right, so the oscillator is putting out one as a signal, right? Because it has zero frequency, and one is 100 dB. Why? Because it's arbitrary what, how many, you know, how loud 100 dB is chosen to be. Decibels are a relative scale, but in PD there's a convention that 100 dB is equal to one. All right. Now we're, we'll set the oscillator doing something. So we'll say let's let's play A440. And then, lo and behold, the thing drops by almost exactly 3 dB, 3.0. Well, anyway, 3ish dB. Uh, that's because when you start an oscillator going. It, you know, it does hit 1, it does hit minus 1, but the average value in root mean square land, in other words, if you took that out, if you took it and averaged it in the way that you get when you square the thing, average it, and then take the square root, that's called the root mean square, which is the good average for doing things in audio. Uh, the root mean square average of a sinusoid is a half, sorry, the mean, uh, is the square root of a half, it's 0 0.707, ish, right? And, or to put it another way, uh, one half power is almost exactly three decibels. It's 3.02 decibels for people like me. And that's what you get here. Oh, it's 3.01-ish, actually. That's not quite right, but good enough. Okay, notice, though, that this value is exceedingly stable. 
uh, it's, it's, it's nailing it to four decimal places and not varying at all. In fact, if I even make the thing fatter, uh, not that fat, please. Yeah, okay. Look at that. Rock solid. That's just too good to be true, right? Um, now, let's start dropping the frequency. And now you will see that the slower this thing oscillates, yeah, the less there is a tendency. Well, okay, so what's really happening here? The envelope is running every, you know, a certain number of samples, actually. Um, it does an overlap of two, so if it, uh, so it's doing uh, an analysis every 2,000, 2,048 points, but it's doing it on a window of 4,096, so everybody gets seen twice, right? Um, as you get fewer and fewer waves of the oscillator in the window, then depending on the phase of the oscillator right at the beginning of the window, you might get slightly different results. And as you slow the oscillator down so that there are fewer and fewer waves, that there's less and less averaging going on from one part of the waveform to another, and you will get more and more variation. Until, at some point at some horrendously low frequency, like a tenth, say, you actually see the thing. <laughs> right, what's happening now is the oscillator itself is taking 10 seconds to do a cycle, and the analysis period is only one tenth of a second, and so the analysis thing only sees one tiny little portion of the elephant, so to speak. And so now what we're seeing is highly variable. In fact, this is not, what do you say? This, this is not a good representation of the RMS loudness of this oscillator in some sense. Or maybe it is, because what does that even mean when we're doing this? Questions? No. Okay. Uh, at any rate, it will, um, it will turn out that as soon as you get up to a frequency so that or such that a whole cycle fits in the analysis window, so that'll be 10 hertz, by the time you get up there, it's, a, it's able more or less to give a good answer. So in this case, uh, with this big fat window, we can actually measure the loudnesses of oscillators all the way down to about 10 hertz. But if we try to go down to something lower, it starts messing up. Okay. And that is a trade-off with the size of the, uh, it's another trade-off, in fact, with the size of this window, this analysis window. So this is slow. This is only giving us, well, let me put it another way. If, if you put something in with a sharp attack, um, you know, the thing was off and the thing is now suddenly on, you might actually want to know right when that attack is in time. And so you might want to have some time resolution in the output of the envelope follower. Okay. The time resolution here is terrible. It's, it's a tenth of a second. And so if you gave it an attack, you would see the thing sort of decide there was nothing, but then, then over an entire tenth of a second gradually decide that there actually, yes, was indeed a signal there. Right? So if you made that window smaller, then it would give you a more and more high time resolution estimate of when that attack occurred. So that would be a good reason for wanting to keep this window size small, so that you get good time resolution. But, of course, the, um, as the time resolution goes up, the frequency goes up that you have to get to before the thing works. So again, if you decide that this thing is going to be a hundredth of a second long, then unless you have at least a hundred hertz sign in usoid, it sounds like the thing's getting louder and softer on that time scale. Right. So uh, different time scales will tell different stories. So here, yeah, so it's hundred times per second, a uh, hundred-ish times per second is about 512 samples. And it can't do 10 hertz. It can still do a hundred-ish hertz, I think. Yeah. In fact, 512, uh, if I remember correctly, this is 1 86th of a second. Now, why do I know that? Because I'm this sort of sick person who actually stays up all night working on these things and sad. that's a constant that comes back over and over again. So I should be able to go down to about 86 hertz and still get decently stable results, but when I drop below 86 hertz, yeah, then it starts going nuts. So this number 86 is sort of the, the bottom <laughs> frequency at which this gives me a stable result. 
But this is a nice fast envelope follower. It sits in 86th of a second, so it will tell me when an attack is to, to within whatever that is in 86th of a second time resolution. And that is a trade-off. That trade-off is, um, isn't, but you could sort of hand-wavingly call that the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. In fact, you, when you get into chapter 9 of the book, you'll actually really see the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. But you'll have to do Fourier analysis to, to do it for real. Okay, so, so this is envelope following and how to, choose this, uh, how to choose this number depending on how low frequencies you want to be able to deal with. All right. Questions about this? Okay. Oh, outcome decibels. Frequently you want other units besides decibels like just RMS linear units and then you have all these wonderful conversion objects like dB to RMS that you can use to fix that. Um, and another little thing is, um, as, as, as you've seen in other situations, if you put nothing in, it considers nothing to be 0 dB, although actually nothing is minus infinity dB. It, won't, it refuses to give you a number below 0 for, I don't know what, for some sort of sanity reasons. Okay? Now, envelope following is great, but the other thing that you might want to know about a, or another thing that you might want to know about a signal is what is the pitch of the signal? So the sort of basic things that you talk about in music are pitch and loudness. Well, time, of course, but time is just passing. So how do you get pitch? Well, the answer is you reach for a different object. So I'm just going to tell you what object it is. It's called Sigmund tilde. And Sigmund tilde, it's named, for, it's named because it does analysis. And out comes, uh, out comes pitch and envelope. And the pitch is the good output, or the interesting output for right now. It's in MIDI units, and here, this is stupid. Um, this could have just been zero too, but um, for some reason, uh, I ended up thinking that a, that you wanted to be able to deal with MIDI values that were below zero for describing vibrato speeds and things like that, which are below MIDI zero. And so, this is really the smallest number that you can reasonably represent in pitch. This is this is the this is the MIDI number for the smallest possible floating point number, almost exactly. Okay, and here you put your nice oscillator in, and out comes a number which should ideally be the uh, MIDI pitch, not the frequency in hertz, uh, corresponding to this frequency. So theoretically, now if I converted from uh, if I converted from MIDI to frequency, then I should be getting out the frequency of this oscillator. Sorry, the pitch of this oscillator. And this is horrendously stable, right? Uh, this is changing by 0 0.005 hertz plus or minus, which is probably inaudible, right? And in fact, I'm, I'm torturing it a little bit by giving it this very low frequency. Um, if I give it something more reasonable, like A440, now it's down to a part in, you know, it's, it's down to a part in a million. Right? So this is, this is, you know, good, you know, numerically accurate stuff going on. Um, unfortunately, it's not true that real signals um, have periodicity, right? And so when you give it a real signal, no one will ever know whether it's saying something accurate or not because what, what could you measure it against? Somebody else's notion of what the pitch should be. So who knows what the accuracy of this thing is, really? Um, and so, uh, but at any rate, to use it, you just, for instance, run the analog to digital converter into it, and now you get, when nothing's happening, it's still gives you that, but then when you start meh, giving it pitch, then you start seeing numbers come out. Hello? And of course, you know, speech is not singing, but speech still has pitch, right? So now we can do the following horrible thing. Oh, and by the way, this is another copy of the envelope, just because it computes the, it computes the envelope anyway uh, as a byproduct of what it has to do internally, and so it gives it to you. So now we'll just take that and use it to drive a nice oscillator. Why not? Right? So let's say uh, 
simplest way to make a nice sound is probably to take an oscillator and then to add something to it. Oh, wave shape it, right? So we'll add something to it and then to take the cosine. So here I'm not going to dwell on it, but this is this is wave shaping as as you saw a few classes ago. Uh, and then we'll say cosine. And then I want to listen to the output. Oh wait, I want to multiply it by something to control the amplitude. All right. Let's see. I'm not going to need this anymore now. Put this up where we can see it. Don't need that. And now, let's see. So to control the amplitude, we'll take this and multiply it by the output of a line. All the good usual stuff. And now, I'll just take these frequencies. Oh, I don't want to give it minus. Oh, that's. Ugh. I got rid of that other thing, which is what I really need this thing in hertz, not in MIDI, right? So I did need that other. Go away. Okay, we're going to convert MIDI to frequency. And by the way, I don't like those. Uh, I don't like those uh, zero values. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, only give me people who were at least you know, something reasonable like 20 hertz. And now what's going to happen is. When it actually gets, it's, it's hearing my fan and stuff like that right now, but whenever it gets a pitch, you see it, and then, like here, uh, and then when it doesn't have a pitch, it just freezes on whatever the previous pitch was, right? Okay. So this now will be our nice uh, oscillator frequency, and now what we're going to do is take this number here, convert it. So it's in dB, so we have to say dB to RMS. And I'm going to sneak a look at it and make sure we've got something reasonable. Yep, before I go uh, playing it. And then we will, okay, so this, let's see, so Sigmund by default has, uh, is running at 86 hertz, which is every, I knew this, is every 11-ish milliseconds, 12-ish maybe. So we're going to pack this with 12. You could measure that, by the way, but I'm not going to get into it. And now we are ready to listen to the result. All right, this could be good and it could be awful. Hello? Yep. Wow. Stupid. Why is there the oh, I know. Um, I put a. So that the bird would work, I put a huge delay on the audio. So I got to say, this bird is computing at 10 frames a second, so I put about a 100 millisecond delay on the audio so that the thing can think for a tenth of a second to try to compute this thing, so now you hear this huge delay. And if I, uh, I'll have to stop the bird rendering if I want to take the delay out. But, so we'll just live with the delay for right now because everyone seems to like the bird, right? <laughs> okay. So now what you got is just for me uh, turned into nothing. Right? So this is a nice voice control synthesizer. Okay, so you can. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah right. It's the... <laughs> yeah, that's actually a trombone with a mute. Yeah, but uh, but you could have done it this way. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that's a demonstration just of using pitch and amplitude to control some very simple synthesis voice, right? Okay. Um, about Sigmund, um, pitch tracking is a much more complicated thing to do than envelope following. Envelope following, you just you know square things and add them up, and you're happy. Pitch tracking, uh, there are at least a thousand papers on how to determine the pitch of an uh, of an acoustic signal. And Sigmund happens to use one, which I just sort of pulled out of the hat and works OK. I don't have any proof that it works better than anyone else's, right? Um, 
I think it works pretty well as, as these things go. And in fact, I've, this is the third one I've written, and it works better than the first two, I think, for most signals. Uh, you can get it to do all sorts of stuff. Uh, in particular, it has, to do, it has to find the sinusoidal peaks that are, uh, that are present in the signal so that it can try to figure out the pitch. It does it you, basically using the frequency domain. And as a result, you can ask, ask it to output not just the pitch, but all the sinusoids it found, all the sinusoidal components. And you can catch those, and then you can make a bank of oscillators that plays just sinusoids following the tracks, and then you'll get a resynthesis of your sound in sinusoids which can be a very powerful thing to have because then you can, for instance, freeze a sound or, or morph it into some different kind of sound. Okay. So I'm not going to show you how to do that because it would take, you know, it would take some time to work it all up, but, but it, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff that Sigmund can do for you that, that's worth looking at. Okay. And the help window is scarily uh, detailed. All right, so what I'm going to do instead of doing that is move on to another thing, the, the other main analysis thing that PD comes with, which is useful, which is called bonk tilde. This is the attack detector. Um, I told, uh, yeah, so I mentioned, although I didn't, um, didn't dwell on it, that the, this bird example actually has an attack detector in it. Oh, the bird died. Oh, I turned the mic off. Hello? So uh, the way the attack detection is happening here is very, very crude, and I won't dwell on it, but basically it's, it's got a pair of thresholds, and whenever the uh, amplitude goes below a low threshold, the thing is off, and then whenever it goes back through the high threshold, it's on. And there's a very simple state machine patch that does that that you can go look up. It's a good thing to learn how to do if you ever want to detect beginnings of things. That's, that, that's the way. Bonk is a thing that um, um, is actually for detecting attacks with a very high time resolution. So a higher time resolution than an envelope follower could possibly give you. Um, what it is is a filter bank, and there's a paper about it and all that kind of nonsense. But what it does is you just run a signal in, and by default it's hypersensitive. So rather than go mess with its parameters, there, there are hundreds of parameters you can give it, I'm just going to cheat and take my incoming signal and multiply it by 1 30th so that it's about right. And now I'm going to go get a button just so it'll flash whenever it gets happy. And now Finding pitches there. That's funny. Don't know why that is. Anyway, um, now I have something that whenever I give it an attack, um, it puts out a message. And this is a good thing if you want to do something like, uh, well, I won't insult your intelligences by doing this, but for instance, attach this to choose a random number and, and play a reset bell tone or something like that. And then you have something where you can just do this and out come, out come bells or something like that. Right? And that would be a very, very simple, you know, sort of elementary thing that you could do with it. Here's a slightly less elementary thing. Um, yeah, I'm going to see if I can get away with dropping the audio advance. I don't know if this is going to work or not because I, I want a smaller delay. Is it still working okay? Hello. Yep, sort of. Now, can we go down to 50? 50, anyone? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, we're happy. All right, this is not instantaneous, but it's close. To, it's fast enough that um, you can sort of pretend it's instantaneous. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is go here and show you, for instance, how you can use this to measure time. So I, I should have told you this before, but there's a wonderful object called timer, which you use in the following way. You click on the left inlet and it sets a, sets a stopwatch in a sense and then you click on the right and it reads it out. So, bing, bing, one second. Okay? And then if you whack it again, it tells you how many seconds still since this last one was done. So now we just see rising numbers. Okay? Timer. 
Okay. Timer is, in, in a sense, the opposite of metronome, right? Metronome, you give it a time value, and it, and it generates events at, at, at desired times. The timer, you, you supply the events, and it tells you what the time was. So those two things might be a good thing to put in um, uh, in concert. For instance, um, oh, yeah. So for instance, uh, suppose we wanted only one button. Let's do this. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just uh, time the dis the I'll measure the amount of time between two different hits of the same button. So we, every time we get a bang from the button, we'll read the timeout and then we'll reset the timer. And then I'm going to check what that does for us. So now we have button and so now we just have incremental times, right? Great. And now we could do something like. Oh, this could be a good time for a metronome. So let's, um, we'll need a bang and a float. And then we'll feed it to a metronome. Ah, running out of room. And I'm going to want this. Right. Let's get this out of here. Maybe I should shut this up now. <laughs> okay. All right. So now, we've already got a cool thing that will take um, events coming in and measures tempo, right? Okay, so now we have a way to measure tempo and have a synchronized um, drum machine or, or metronome, I guess. We'll just uh, say, We'll set, have that be the time of the metronome, and then we'll start the metronome whenever we get a measurement. And then I will make that flash for now. Although I'll do something more interesting in a moment. What if, for instance, every time we find out that there's an attack from Bach, we just record what the attack was? Now, you could do this well, but I'm going to do this sloppily. Uh, sloppy is we make a table. Uh, let's make it 10 seconds worth. And then uh, we'll use tab write to record the table. And we'll just start recording whenever Bach says bang. And what we'll record is the audio coming in. Okay, and then every time this metronome goes whack, we will just play the results of the table. And again, I'll just be as low tech as I possibly can. Tab play. And then we'll get one of these to listen to it. Now, is this going to work? My voice is triggering it at crazy moments. That's actually not so bad. But um, what I really want to do is something more like, hello. Hello. Why is that not working? Oh, right. It's recording a new. I have to do this. Hello. You get the idea. <laughs> so now we have a. An, that's right. What? How can I describe this? This is a um, tempo-driven sequencer. It's a thing that measures the tempo of incoming events and loops at the same tempo as it's picking up. Obviously, you're going to want to do this on someone who actually. Well, if you want this thing to work, you might have to practice having the thing not get set off accidentally and figure out very carefully what your thresholds are and where your mic is. Otherwise, someone's going to sneeze in the audience and set it off, and, and you'll, you'll be embarrassed. 
So, so usual rules of show business apply. But at any rate, this is a, this is a simple example of something that, that uses Blanc for a non-trivial and interesting thing. Any questions about how this is working? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah, that would. Okay, yeah. So Bonk does a whole bunch of other stuff that I haven't described here. <laughs> so the original purpose to having Bonk was um, to be able to actually transcribe a drum set in real time. So it not only picks out attacks, but it also tries to classify instruments by the, the um, by their timbre. And I'm not going to try to do it here right now because you, you need drum instruments and, and sticks to do this well. You, you would need to, to do a much better job of miking and playing than I can do right now. But, um, but it will actually attempt to, it'll give you a number from zero to n where you've trained it on n different kinds of incoming sounds. And that's what I was using it for in 97, was someone was playing a, a drum set in, in Portland and we were listening to it in New York. And what we're doing is transcribing the drum and then sending the transcription over the uh, network. Yeah. Yeah, that's a whole thing. Yeah, all, the, all this stuff has a lot of history. <laughs> People do stuff. People have been doing computer music for 20, 30 years now, so no more than that, since 57. So lo lots of this stuff, it goes a lot deeper than I'm talking about right now. Yep. Okay, so basic notions are, uh, this is the stupid thing that you just reach for whenever you want to know how loud something is. These are the uh, sophisticated things that um, take a little bit of computation time, but uh, will do cool things like figure out pitch or, uh, or rhythms, attacks. Yeah? How did you get on the very first one you showed to make a copy, to record a copy? Was that the... What? Wait, say that again? Um, like for example, when you were triggering the... Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what is? Oh, right. So what's happening is when you do this, then what you get is the last thing. It doesn't play what happened between the two recordings, or it doesn't play what happened between the two clicks. But what it plays is what happens after the second click. So that's why you, to, to do, you know, to get it to whistle, you do. And there I was being careful to do something that wouldn't re-trigger it, <laughs> or else it would have done something else. Yeah. And of course, if you don't keep changing it, it gets boring fast. Other questions about this? So this is all just kind of, this is the very simplest kinds of, oh, here's what you can do with audio analysis. Let me make one more good example, or at least an example I like. <laughs> it's probably not a good example. Okay, so let's go back to Sigmund here, which is giving us frequencies. And here we're already, um, uh, what's sorry word? We're, we're already filtering out so that we only get the frequencies which, where it actually believes there's a, a pitch there. Right. We're filtering out all the zeros. Okay, so now what would happen if we took our sound uh, okay, so first off, sound. Okay, ring modulation. Everyone knows about this. We'll take take a sound and multiply it by an oscillator. Oh, we are running out of room. Let's put this over here. I'll try to remember about it later. Okay, so now ring modulation. Take a take an incoming sound, multiply it by an oscillator. And I'll give the oscillator a frequency, which I'll control with a number box to start with. And so I already did this quite a few weeks ago, but now we have a nice, hello, okay, do this, and then we have a nice ring modulator, okay? Now, ring modulation is a thing which gives you a nice harmonic result if you happen to hit the tone that it is. Like, I think I can hit 90 hertz. Uh, and then it gives me something good, but if I give it a different pitch, like uh, then it gives me something in harmonic, right? Because that's how ring modulation is. Okay. Well, what if you uh, what if you just decided to keep the thing harmonic by taking this pitch tracked signal and making it 
the modulating sound. In fact, that's not going to be terribly interesting, but let's, let's do something a little destructive and multiply it by 20. Oh, we don't need that tilde. So now we're going to ring modulate by a frequency which is 20 times the measured frequency of my voice. And now we have a wonderful, uh, okay, so still kick. Uh, ooh, it's bad. Yeah, I'm having trouble because this bird is still running. Uh, uh, but, so it's not continuous, but it, it would be continuous if I wasn't running the bird right now. But the bird is important, so we're going to keep the bird up. <laughs> Actually, let's go back and um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell it you can be a little slower. Maybe we'll get away with this for a little while. Uh, yeah, it hates itself, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm just overloading the, the CPU right now. Uh, okay, so, that, so there's a thing. That's pretty bad. Now, um, another thing is uh, you can always take any sound that you want and drop it by an octave by ring modulating it by half of its original frequency. Right? This is a well-known effect. Hello, and now you have me on an octave. Except, of course, you know, if if you divide by if you divide the frequency of the incoming sound the, the pure fundamental frequency by two and then ring modulate by it then you'll only get the odd harmonics right? so right now what you hear is an odd oh, harmonic nice. sound that it is an octave below what you hear the same, same right? right okay if you want a natural one that's to say a sound that has both odd and even harmonics then you would take the ring modulated sound but you would then add in the um, the non unmodulated sound too. Like this. And now you have the good uh, uh, octave divider. Right? This, this is, is, I don't know, this sounds better to people who have higher pitched voices than me. But um, that's an all-purpose trick. In fact, that's that's plugins these days. You just reach for a plugin when you want that in your in your uh, in your sound montage system. But th this is this is basically how this things work, more or less. And now you can do it real time. Okay. So so there's nothing funny about the chain. The chain is nothing but taking the ADC and multiplying it by an oscillator. But and th the reason it's interesting now, or the thing that's making it interesting now, is the fact that we're using the audio analysis to parameterize the, the, uh, the thing that we're doing to the audio stream. Right. And you can do this with very, very small delays. There is a delay associated with, with trying to figure out the pitch of a signal, which is on the order of the window size of the analysis, which by default I think for Sigmund is 1,024 samples, but I'm not sure. Uh, however, this signal chain that's going from the ADC to the output doesn't have much of any delay at all. It's just taking, it's just going in and out. And so the thing is, is, is real time in the sense of having a very, very small delay, except that the uh, pitch that's modulating by is always going to be slightly out of sync with reality, because the pitch determination is always going to be 10 or 20 milliseconds late. Can you delay the microphone signal? You could, and then you would maybe get a slightly better sound, but you would also hear the hear more delay. So that would be a trade-off. Uh, yeah, and that could work better for voice, but that wouldn't work terribly well for guitar or, or percussive sounds where the delay is not good. Right? Okay, so this is, the, this is the menagerie of audio analysis stuff that's useful. Okay. And now I'm going to, yeah, oh yes, I am going to save it. Uh, and this is all in one patch, so this is going to be a Glorious mess when you try to download it. Whoops. O U S. Probably still misspelled. Okay. And now, what I want to do is go back and see. We're going to have to do some triage here because we got through this and then everything else is kind of not happening. Um, I'm, so I'm not going to show you net send and net receive. This is, if you have two computers, you can, gen messages only, this will not work with audio, although you can find objects in PD Extended that will do this for audio too. If you have two computers and if you know the IP address of computer number two, 
which unfortunately has to be an IPv4 address. It doesn't know IPv6. Uh, you can send messages from the one to the other, and they're just PD messages. Uh, how it works is the messages gets, just get printed as ASCII and sent in network packets. And the objects that do that, it's, it's like send and receive, but it's called net send and net receive, and you have to give it the IP address or name, host name of the machine that you're sending to. Um, among other things, uh, you can, um, no, don't do that. <laughs> you can all, yeah, you can all, if, if you're one of these people that likes to project your patch while you're playing it, you can put a net receive up there and then people in the audience who are in the know can send you messages <laughs> and change your sound. Okay. Can you do what? Yeah. So, you, so, so net receive uh, takes a port number, which is IP language. You give it a number like 3000, which is just a number that it will address by. And then the net send, which is on a different machine, has to know the machine's IP address and has to know the port number. And that port number can be a way by which you can have net receives that are receiving streams of messages from several different places using different ports. Right. Okay. Um, read SF, write SF. If um, so far I've only told you how to um, record things into arrays, which of course is then limited by how much memory you feel like giving the array. And also there's a bad thing, which is that when you read and write an array to disk, PD itself grinds to a halt while your computer synchronously reads or writes what might be several megabytes of data. Right? So getting sound to and from disk is not, uh, using, using arrays and tables is not a real-time activity. It's a thing that you would do as you, you know, before the show, as, you, as you're setting up, or before you start making sound anyway. Um, there's another thing, which is a pair of objects which actually spool sound to disk using a separate thread so that it can happen in real time. And that's the objects called readSF and writeSF. And they are almost shockingly easy to use. Um, so here, for instance, uh, let's just make us, uh, I don't know. There's a nice oscillator. Here is a writeSF object. And I'm going to give it the name of the sound file. I'm going to throw it in temp just to be. That's the most, no, it's going to be more portable if I just put it right here. Uh, oh, except I'm being nuts. Wait, it's just write SF, and then, then you can tell it how many channels you want, but by default it's one channel. You can make a hundred channels if you want. Now I'm going to have a message. Message, please. And the message says to open a, a sound file. Um, And then you tell it, once it's got something open, there are messages to start and then to stop. Actually, let's make this be the microphone again. Okay. This is not going to work perfectly because uh, I have Jim running. Um, yeah, so here it is. We'll just say, hi, this is a recording. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, I didn't connect the start button, and I didn't tell it to start, which so it didn't do anything. And also, I've got this other thing running, which is going to get irritating, so let's get that out of here. Okay, and well, let's save this. It's going to be called record. And now, maybe I could do this. All right. Okay, so we open it and then we say start. This is a test. This is only a test. And then we say stop. And now we have a sound file. I'm not going to try to play it for you because I would have to make the I'd have to make another patch with a read SF object, but it exists, don't worry. But if I went and looked now, I would find a nice file called soundf1.wave, which would be a 16-bit PCM sound file uh, with with that thing that I just did. So now you can save your save the wonderful sounds you're making in patches. It'll do 16 or 24 bit, or 32, in fact, if you want to say floating point. And it'll do wave or AIFF, although floating point AIFF is a bit of a stretch, I think. Yep. And it is tin till, so I'm going to just not tell you all the other good stuff. Uh, PD tilde, if you have a multiprocessor, will allow you to 
have all your processes running separate PDs and send signals back and forth between them in case you run out of gas. And yeah, uh, show up, uh, yeah, well, show up obviously on Tuesday for finals presentations. And also, Tom Erb will be teaching 172, and he's wonderful. So, everybody show up for 172 and check that out. Thank you.